And welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a great break. Please take your seats. We're about to begin our afternoon program as we continue. We still have a whole afternoon packed with the sessions and the speakers you do not want to miss, whether you're here with us in the room or you're joining us online. Please get ready. And we're going to go with the next session. Now, today in the morning, in the first half of the day, we've heard a lot about AI, the threats, the opportunities, the policy responses. But we also need skills to use and manage AI. And to discuss this dimension, we have a very special guest with us. And this is the session Skills in the Age of AI. And first, we will have a chat with Andrea Nalis from the Federal Employment Agency of Germany. And then we'll have a panel discussion on this topic. Ms. Nalis, please join me on stage. Right, let me remind it once again, Andrea Annal is chair of the executive board of the Federal Employment Agency of Germany. Welcome, thanks so much for being here. And uh, let's just uh, go straight into our discussion. How do you see the role of the public employment services when it comes to preparing job seekers for a job landscape influenced by AI? Hello? Okay. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, yes, um, I think we should not leave anybody behind. Uh, as a federal employment agency in Germany, we also always um, empowered those who are a little bit far away from the labor market. And uh, especially now, when there is so much transformation going on, we need to stress this point. And the um, first step for us is to raise awareness uh, because <laughs> when you go in a German workforce in a company and you say, oh, we have a very good idea, we are wanting to make another round of upskilling, the people don't uh, clap in the hands and uh, they don't say hooray, yes? <laughs> Uh, they, um, they all, there's some hesitancy, um, and not only hesitancy, some of the people are really afraid. Uh, therefore, um, it is uh, our first job uh, to get an awareness that this upskilling is good for the, the employees, and we invent a new idea. Uh, it's called a transformation guides. Uh, what is a transformation guide? Uh, that's um, an employee who um, is especially um, uh, sensibilized. Um, we have a, a skill program for these um, employees. And then they are directly in the company and they are talking with the other employees. They, try to get them uh, a new awareness. They want to uh, they make some hubs to, to strengthen the competence. Mm -hmm. And they are also uh, our, um, yeah, we can say ambassadors for transformation in the companies itself. That, that is the idea. To speak eye side to eye side uh, from employee to employee and not uh, coming from the employers or from the unions or from the politi political side. Um, and these um, transformation guides now we have established in the regions, for example, in northern Germany, in southwest Germany, and um, it's uh, really quite successful because um, the people are not afraid to, to talk about that they are afraid. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is really the... the, the like the, embracing yeah, and accepting it. Exactly, yes, that's it. Therefore, awareness, to, to build awareness is one of the tools we try to use, um, and that is quite effective. I like these ambassadors for transformation. That's, <laughs> a, that's a very way, good way of putting it. Uh, well, we know it's even harder to engage in training those that may need this training the most. Which should be the strategy to address these new demands and, as you said, not leave anybody behind? Well, um, the second thing is, I think, um, we, we, we have a lot of 
um, possibilities for upskilling in Germany. We have a lot of, um, yes, uh, in regional, uh, there are a lot of providers for upskilling in Germany. Uh, when you ask me, it's very intransparent. Mm. Nobody knows really what's going on. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> we uh, um, will establish a new platform, a digital platform. It's called Now. Um, I have to, to look uh, what the exactly translation is. I always forget it, really. But it's, <laughs> it's a national online training portal. And in this uh, national training portal, the uh, people in employment, uh, the employees and the employers and the training providers, um, uh, they are uh, responsible for the content. And uh, for example, we have um, a proof of concept with this uh, platform. There was an employer with 15 people, a dental labor in München, and uh, she has to uh, upskill the, the staff with, uh, because one of the biggest customers want a digitalization uh, tool. And then um, she didn't know what to do. It was uh, Mrs. Müller. It was very typical Mrs. Müller. And uh, uh, the, the platform on, didn't only provide the, the, uh, the training providers in the region around Munich. It also helped uh, the, uh, to, um, to inform her, uh, the Mrs. Müller about the um, uh, supports so she could reduce the costs for the training because she, she got the information uh, where she can um, use some, um, pro, uh, uh, subscribe some support. So that is a really interesting thing. We had a proof of concept yet. In January, it will be on the federal level in Germany, and we are the hosts of the, the uh, federal employment uh, agency. We are the hosts of this platform, and I hope that it will reduce, um, uh, it will increase the number of people who um, uh, are involved in, um, yes, upskilling. Uh, therefore, I hope this will be a success. It's now a very interesting thing. We started in January. Maybe we can, when we can have a review at the end of next year, but I'm hopeful that it's very successful in the end. Uh, let's, her, let's, let's now focus a little bit uh, on some of the threatening messages and how AI and automation will make certain jobs disappear. Is there anything employment agencies can do to mitigate this risk? Are you working in, you know, together and deal with relevant stakeholders such as industry, social partners, or public authorities to address this problem in a more holistic way? Yes, and it is necessary, I think. It's not, uh, it's the, 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 problems that people are skeptical, um, they are not new. Uh, when the first robots um, emerged in the factories, we have the same debate. But uh, it's very rapid, rapid uh, transformation now. Uh, therefore, I think it's really uh, frightening sometimes. And um, I, for example, um, uh, organized with other uh, companies and a public sector, a human-friendly automation initiative. Uh, this is um, very necessary because we have to give some assurance that automation and AI are not beyond ethical questions, not beyond the question of a participation and uh, workers, councils have to be part of these decisions. And therefore, we initiate this human-friendly automation initiative. And when I uh, declare it for the 130,000 uh, employees of the Federal um, um, Employment Agency in Germany that we have a decade of automation in front of us, uh, there were a little bit discussion, oh, what's this? And then I told them, but there will be nobody lose 
the job. He actually has maybe, it is very important to assure that we don't do this automation thing because we want to get rid of people, but because we need to do it because we have a demographic situation. You see, we will lose 40,000 people from 130 we have now in the next 10 years. And I'm sure when we don't have automation, I'm not able to provide the services we now provide in Germany as an agency. So, automation is a part of the answer. It's part of the solution. But it is a long way to get our employees to believe this. <laughs> and the Human Friendly Automation Initiative tries to address these problems, uh, try to, to give space to talk about this, uh, these things, uh, and ma makes a lot of assurances for the employees. To st uh, that is uh, what we are doing. Not all companies are joining us yet, but uh, a couple of companies, big companies, IBM in Germany, for example, or a big energy company, the pension system, uh, the, the, we, we are getting bigger and bigger. So it's, yeah, growing Because everybody circle. knows we have to do something. Human-friendly automation is the future. So it's also about the, the importance and the necessity of proper communication among that circle and also strengthening the, the trust. Exactly. To get that. Yes. And um, when, we, when I think it's, it's a question of trust, but also a question of uh, to understand what we are doing, what's going on. A lot of people don't understand what AI is, is really, um, because the white color jobs now are um, in the center of this transformation. Uh, in the past years, it was all the robots in the factories. That's very distant from most of the uh, people in my, car, um, in my agency. It was something to look like in a, uh, in a botanical zoo, yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, now it's getting more and more a, a topic for the, for the, the white color people. And therefore, I think we need another uh, communication and we need other initiatives. And, ethical codexes, and that is what we are trying to do with the Human Friendly Automation Initiative. I think we don't need it only in Germany. We need such a kind of Human Friendly Automation Initiative on all over Europe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And finally, um, air power tools are becoming very sophisticated, as you say, and may even be powerful too for employment services as something that you already touched upon. How can you incorporate the technologies to improve the services you provide and are the risks associated to these? Well, we, we use uh, AI already. Uh, last week we won a big uh, award in Germany <laughs> because uh, we, we try to use it as an assistance for our employees um, to be more, uh, to be faster, to be more specific, to be more individual uh, when it comes to um, support, uh, supporting our customers. And therefore, um, we invent, for example, when um, uh, employers write us emails, yes, and uh, they, they, are, they are looking for, they are uh, looking for uh, staff people. Um, we now um, uh, use AI, um, and then uh, we can give them a better, uh, a range, a better range of um, uh, possible candidates uh, to use uh, as uh, to to uh, to uh, try to to get a better matching, mm -hmm. and that is a very new in Germany, and it's um, maybe in other countries already established. I don't know. But we are now going to, um, uh, to use AI in, I think in the next years, we will increase it step by step. The big point is that we really talk with our people, the customers and our, only, uh, our own uh, staff people. We make some digital talks. <laughs> right. Uh, because, um, we, we uh, learned uh, that it is very important that the people understand what this AI is able to do and what is not, what is not able to do. 
And in the end, um, it was very reassuring that we say it's only assistance. It is, uh, you can make the decision in the end. That's your decision. Uh, and that's so not the decision of, of the Yeah, it's not there to uh, make a decision and to make the call, uh, the, yeah. Uh, the AI, yes. So that, is, that was very good for, for the acceptance in our company, yes. So yeah, again, the matter of trust as well and understanding on who is exactly. making the calls and taking the yes. decisions. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea Nahles, Chair of the Executive Board of Federal Employment Agency of Germany. Thank you once again Thank for this you. conversation. And we're going to continue. I want to invite now on stage Leticia Cayuto and Ben Bottas, the speakers for the second part of this, uh, of this session. Please come and join me on stage. And I'm going to just remind everybody that uh, you can uh, use the slider tool and we're going to be able to take some questions and comments by the end. That's like the third part of this session where we're going we're gonna to hear from you and some of the questions from the audience as well. And uh, there we go, the speakers are here. We're gonna continue and uh, let me first introduce, we have uh, next to me Leticia Cayuto, Managing Director in Accenture, leading uh, data and AI business in Europe and the controversial AI domain globally. That's correct. And also we have Ben Butter, CEO of Euro Chambers, organization representing 20 million businesses through its members, who is also leading the EU funded center of vocational excellence project focusing on AI. Once again, thank you very much for being here. Leticia, let's start with you, please. Considering your experience, how do you think AI industry will impact the labor market? Thank you very much, Sasha, for having me here. I think before, I want, before um, going into the, uh, the question, I wanted to kind of uh, share that we've done a, a survey recently, a Pearl survey with C-Suite. Uh, we work primarily with the FTSE 500. And um, of 2003, uh, 300 uh, executive, and we found that actually the pace, you know, going back to the previous session, yeah. is unprecedented, and 91% of the executive in EU have already reallocated found. 91%. 91%. And it actually looks like we are taking it faster than North America, uh, because the result in North America is 87%. I'll eat your heart out there. Uh, so, you know, um, and mo you know, all company, 97% of the companies overall globally were thinking it was a complete game changer. And uh, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, uh, there was a 88% of the EU uh, exec very supportive of the new regulation coming up from the EU, and even more support coming up from the North America mm -hmm. uh, individual, 96%. Uh, so, you know, it will transform the labor market. It's already happening. We can see the dynamics of the market kind of happening. Now, how is it going to transform it? I think going back to the earlier bits of the session, it will transform it, and that's a good thing. One of the other stats I wanted to pull out there is 60% um, of the jobs of today didn't exist in 1940. Uh, so, you know, we have to reinvent all of this. We do see uh, a very, um, we think that 40% of the working hours are going to be impacted overall on the, on the job market. We did a, a report recently with the WEF and analyzed that 19,000 tasks in, 80, in 861 jobs were going to be impacted. But what we do see is obviously a job is composed of tasks and, and none of the job would be uh, fully automated. So it's really working with the AI rather than replacing uh, the, the, the human. We do see industries that are more impacted than others, uh, like for example, some segment in financial services or in insurance, uh, the information technology market, like the computer science, and obviously uh, uh, the, the delivery of technology, digital technology. The same with uh, communication, digital communication. Uh, you know, those sectors seems to be most impacted uh, by, by this kind of technology, especially large language model. 
Right, well, that's, uh, that, that's some fascinating statistics there, and thank you so much for bringing it. I do love the fact that it's about 91% here in this part of the pond. That's, that sounds great. Ben, how are the job roles evolving as a result of AI integration, and what skills are becoming essential? Because we try to focus it all on the skills, you know, they say skills are the currency of the future. Well, it is currency of today as well already. That's, this time has come. Do they vary across industries and job functions as well? Okay, well, like Leticia, can I start with some you can, yes. background inf information? Because um, as is a little different, uh, I guess it's a slightly different catchment area that Chambers of Commerce uh, are working with. Our constituency is mainly small and medium-sized enterprises across the European Union and, and further afield in some neighboring countries as well. Um, and just two days ago, we held a very big event here in Brussels called the European Parliament of Enterprises. When we fill the hemicycle, we kick out the politicians for a day and we replace them with entrepreneurs from all over Europe. Um, and one of the sessions was dedicated to, to skills. And in fact, Joost Korte was there and spoke during, during that event. Um, and we've, uh, at each of these events, which we've now held six times, we ask a question whether it is harder to recruit people than it was five years ago. Um, and each time the figure, the answer is yes, but this time it was dramatically yes. So 91% of the respondents said it is harder to recruit than it was five years ago. So it's not a, an infinite pool of, of, of people out there to, for, to whom uh, businesses can turn for work. So to us, AI is part of the solution by um, covering some of the some of the, some of the tasks that are currently delivered by by employees uh, to allow them to work in in other areas. Uh, and another statistic I would give you is based on our uh, annual economic survey, the last edition of which was published last week, and it's based on replies from from 43,000 businesses across Europe. <clears throat> And the top three challenges, the first, perhaps unsurprisingly, was the cost of energy. Mm. But behind that was skill shortages and labor costs. So it's clearly a big issue for businesses. Um, and we feel that AI, um, as Andrea said in the previous se session, is part of the solution to that skills shortage, potentially. So it's not a threat so much as, as part of the whole um, skills and um, employment equation. Um, we recently ran a survey in the framework of the, the, the project that you mentioned, the ULEP project, which is funded under Erasmus Plus um, within the Centers of Vocational Excellence uh, call. Um, and one of the first things we saw is that we need to demystify AI among small businesses. Most of them don't really know what it means yet. Do you feel like small businesses in particular are more cautious and worried about that? I, I'm not sure if it's so much caution as just lack of aware, lack of knowledge about. Do you think it's more like it, it's more evident with small businesses? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, because they don't have the 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 departments who may be right. looking into this. If you ask them what their view is on the AI regulation, most of them probably don't know that there is an AI regulation in the pipeline. Chambers are trying to inform them, but it's not part of the core business of a small business owner to 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 monitor um, EU policy developments. So they need informing, they need knowledge, um, they need to help with demystifying um, what AI actually means for them. Um, so that's point one, that they need to actually understand what AI is. Um, and then in relation to the skills mm -hmm. that would be needed, um, the feeling is that it's a mixture of technical and transversal skills. We can't predict which technical skills it implies yet, and I'd be lying if I said that we could. But there are a number of transversal skills which we think are critical to, to the use of AI in the business model of many small businesses. Leticia, before we go to the second round of questions where we're going to talk about some uh, policy responses, do you want to comment on uh, to add something there? I can, I can add, but obviously it's a different uh, kind of segment. Yeah. Um, so I think in the larger company, uh, we do we do start to see uh, some uh, demand on, on new type of roles, like for example a large language model architect. We're starting to talk about convergence architecture of the IT system, where we have the existing digital core and we want to bolt in 
um, you know, some of the AI technology. We have roles that are emerging around AI ethicist or responsible AI domain, where actually to be able to, uh, you know, go along with the regulation and, and, and do um, business responsibly, a number of companies are strengthening the process, you know, being clearer on the core value, organizing the governance on how to take the decisions at what level and be able to track it. So we also have some emerging, you know, like some new roles around user interaction. Obviously, technology like large language model are changing the way human and machine communicate because right. <laughs> we can speak in natural languages versus, you know, kind of a type or, or just do comments. And, and there again, you know, there is, uh, there is a number of emerging roles, you know, around that transformation kind of element. That you know, how do you kind of reinvent, if you want, what you're currently doing with this kind of technology? Now, in terms of how it will um, kind of be used and what it will represent in terms of services for the citizen or the consumer, it's, 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 it, 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 it's a little bit further away. Yeah? Yeah, and true. what new product? So there are emerging new product we see happening. Um, but, but it's very early days. So I think at the moment, a lot of the AI and generative AI is used for optimization of things we know how to do already. And we're starting to be very clear on how to organize to kind of optimize. You know, there's a world of reinvention. What I tell my client very often is the fourth industrial revolution, you, you can't you know, the, the problems that we have in front of us are not problems of the organization, they're problems of the system. So you don't solve sustainability on your own. You need, you need to have an ecosystem of collaboration. And we start to talk about that concept of um, collaboration advantage or collaborative advantage. So you won't be able to solve the energy transition on your own. You need to collaborate. And, and I think that's where we see a lot of new products uh, potentially coming, coming up, Le you know, using data and this technology to solve those next big problems. Right. Let's go on the um, on this sort of second round of the questions when we're going to focus more on some effective policy responses and some of your ideas there. Uh, ben, on a little bit on Eurochamber's project on vocational excellence. How can vocational training institutions proactively identify and address AI skill gaps through upskilling, reskilling programs? And what role does the center of vocational excellence play in this context? Mm. Well, vocational education and training is, is critical. Yeah. Um, for Chambers of Commerce, it always has been critical, and we've worked very closely with the European Commission over a number of years to ensure that the provision of vocational education and training um, is strengthened across the European Union. Um, it's very well established in a number of member states. In others, it's a bit more patchy. Um, but it's really crucial, and I think that is just as applicable when we're talking about the, uh, um, the application of AI in the workforce. Um, and because it's so fast moving, because it's so dynamic, and because there's so many unknowns, um, we believe that a multi-stakeholder approach to vocational education and training is, is critical, involving um, worker representatives, involving employers, um, and involving intermediary organizations from the public sector and the private sector. And for us, that's where the centers of vocational excellence play a really important role. They're making lifelong learning attractive, and they're doing so through working with a multi-stakeholder group of, of practitioners and, and actors to develop training modules that are um, tailor-made to specific companies needs and to the potential employees that they're, that they're training. So the, the centers of vocational education and training are of considerable added value, potentially, we believe. Uh, Leticia, how are companies such as yours approaching the upskilling and reskilling of workforce when it comes to AI? Yeah, so we made a big announcement uh, recently that we were going to scale up our workforce from 40,000, you know, data and AI specialists to 80,000. So in the next three years, um, and, and we we're firing on all front, uh, which is the upskilling, obviously looking at ac acquisition, um, as well as uh, you know hiring. Uh, 
We have a number of huge programs. So, for example, uh, you know, also in collaboration with academia to do the upskilling, not only on what we know, but what's, what's emerging continuously, because this is not a static technology. This is continuously moving. So, for example, at the beginning of this week, I was in Stanford University, and we have a, a foundation model scholar uh, kind of program. We have a number of other partnerships with other universities to keep kind of our eyes on on how things are moving, and, and we bottle this up into our, our upskilling. That's for specialists, but more broadly, you know, you know Accenture is a very large company, more than 700,000 people globally. We have uh, our CEO is uh, mandating our, our technology caution. So, um, so basically, everybody in the firm needs to go through some of the basics on, on all of that and what it means so they can digest all, you know, you know how they can, uh, you know, change and tune uh, their ways of working. Uh, so so it's, it's an all-firing kind of angle. What I would like to add is what I see with my clients. So I think a, a number of people are having a quite similar approach mm -hmm. on upskilling, so there, there's a lot of work. I think the, the key concerns of big company are is my data ready? Because you know you can't do AI without data, and a lot of you know I think people are worried about the the impact of AI, but actually the impact of bad data is probably worse. Mm. <laughs> it's another important aspect when it comes to readiness. Yeah. Exactly. So you know the data foundation needs to be ready. So you know it's not only AI skilling; it's also data skilling. Then, you know, are the people ready? Then that's the whole topic we just spoke about. But then is my enterprise ready? Is, is the next level up? Because, you know, as all those jobs are, are kind of evolving, you know, they all impact adjacent uh, jobs as well. And, you know, how do you actually reorganize for that? Not only to kind of uh, dissimulate the knowledge and the understanding, but how do you transform a you know, particular unit uh, and, and power it up with, with the right tooling, yeah? Yeah, that's... Uh that's that's the whole the, that's the whole bigger aspect as well when it comes to the bigger picture of readiness. Aban, uh, your latest annual economic survey published just a few days ago highlights skills shortages as one of the top challenges for businesses. Uh, do you make any correlation here with key socioeconomic trends like AI and the digital transformation more generally? No, no specific correlation. In, in fact. Um, uh, it's demographic, of course, the skill mm. shortage issue partially. Um, and as I mentioned before, we, we consider that these, these digital developments are potentially part of the solution to these skills shortages. Um, to, to take one example of the healthcare sector, there are massive shortages in the healthcare sector in many, many countries. Um, and through a number of developments, um, that can be addressed, it can be mitigated. Simple use of a smartwatch with a, um, a heart monitor um, helps reduce, it means that um, potential heart attacks are um, identified earlier and the patient can be dealt with quicker and, and, and looked after. Um, and that means that medical staff can be freed up to do other tasks which they may not otherwise right. be able to do. And of course, there are many other applications of AI in, in the healthcare sector, and that applies across many other sectors. So it's, it's not about. Um, it, the displacement of employment. It's about allowing people to focus on different areas um, and to upgrade the overall provision in that company and in that sector with the application of, of AI. But the skills shortage, as I mentioned at the start of my remarks, is an ongoing issue which we've been seeing as a trend for a number of years within the small business community. Um, there are many different factors which can help, including legal migration, and the Commission came out with a, a new proposal on that yesterday. Um, so indeed, for us, um, it's part of the equation. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a few questions. We're going to take them from the audience here. We could have a little bit more light. And I'm going to also pick up the, the tablet, which I'm sorry, I forgot somewhere there, uh, for the slider questions. So please send both. And for the moment, while well, I'm taking it, thank you so much. Please, uh, can we have a little more light? And I would invite you to raise your hand if and to ask your questions. And if I can see you, give me a second. Do we have any questions from the, 
from the audience. All right. OK, think about it, because we do have quite a few here. We have a question there. Can we have the microphone to the pod, please, of the room? I will take the questions now. I see that you keep coming them here, yeah. In the meantime, I can maybe build on the skills. Please do. Edge. Give us just ah, a second. Sure. So I do think there is a demographic, definitely we aging, and we see with like countries like Japan are uh, you know, ahead of us into the aging uh, population, and they have shortage to the point that you know some of their critical services are you know uh, heavily starting to rely on you know AI and automation. I think there's also an acceleration of the collective consciousness that AI and data is the next wave, and ChatGPT has been that. As a practitioner of data and AI for like more than 10 years, we've, we've been lobbying people saying, this is important, we need to pay attention to the data, the AI. And we had to really kind of pull and, 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 and push. Now, you know, the door is wide open. I think the collective consciousness uh, is, is there because, you know, the chat GPT kind of moment. Uh, and I think it's so that helped this awakening yeah. is accelerating yeah. um, the demand and, and obviously the, the understanding of the shortage we have into some of those things that haven't been necessarily heavily invested in before. Uh, yeah, let's take the question. I, I know, sorry about it. Let's do that. Yeah. No Hi. Uh, Just a second. Yeah. Okay, I think it works. Yeah. Uh, my name is Andre. I'm working with a lifelong learning platform representing the voice of uh, European civil society in education and training. And uh, one way to look at uh, the skill shortages was, of, of course, through raising awareness on the importance of the AI and the needs of uh, the workers should be aware that they have. Um, as is reflected through surveys from companies like PwC. But another way to look at it is through barriers that many of the workers experience in terms of access to training, counting here, um, carrying responsibilities at home, lack of time to engage in working, lack of financial resources for this, lack of guidance into finding the training opportunities. So my question to you is, being aware of all these challenges, how can we encourage lifelong learning and build a culture of lifelong learning across, uh, across the workers, but also adults in general? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, Andre. Me? Yeah, go Ben. Um, it's a good question. For me, it's, it's a mixture of public initiatives um, that can encourage, nudge, both employers and employees to um, pursue training, to enable training. I think it's also partly cultural. As, as people look around them and see how fast moving the economy is, one senses that they become more aware of the importance of reskilling and upskilling throughout their career. Um, so it's, training is inevitably a part of that but um, employers' organizations and employees' organizations and the public uh, authorities need to work together to provide space and time for workers to be able to train and retrain during their work. Um, when I started working, that wasn't the case, but increasingly, I think that has evolved and uh, there are obligations and, um, on employers. Uh, even small businesses in Belgium now have to uh, have an annual training program for their staff. Um, so they have to demonstrate quite clearly that they are um, providing training opportunities, that they're funding training opportunities for their staff. Um, for smaller businesses, it's sometimes a risk because they are, there is a fear that if you train someone, they may just leave and find a better remunerated, more interesting job. And I think we need to be conscious of that fear factor among small businesses um, and thereby reduce the the, the, the cost burden on them, I guess, and, and also the, the um, procedural burden of, of providing training. But nonetheless, to, to, to me, I sense that it's become more a way of life among all actors. Um, perhaps I'm being a bit complacent there, but uh, so it does need to be helped and pushed somewhat. But, uh, but I think we're moving in the right direction. You want to comment? Yeah. yeah. I was, I, w I was thinking about me as a more citizen of the world, meaning I'm a mom of three, 
those kind of technology help me avoid reviewing report, <laughs> uh, doing some uh, coding, uh, debugging with my son and things like that. So I think there is a lot out there also available for people to go inside uh, on, and, and use. And, and obviously, you know, our mechanics needs to kind of work at a working level. But I think as individual, there's a lot of potential and benefit we can all get and get some time back to, 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 to recover all those little bits of time we normally spend as well. Yeah, I always also love the, uh, when, when, when we're discussing uh, these issues, like you, you, you do get a completely different perspective when you put yourself in a thinking as a parent and, uh, you know, thinking how these things could be working with, uh, with everyday life and also for the most important things for the kids and the next generation. Uh, do we have more questions? I do have a lot here on slide. I just to want to make sure that I'm not missing any questions in the room. We do have a question here. Can we have the microphone here in front of the room, please? And then I'm going to pick a few. Please keep them coming. They're, they're really great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pilvi Torsti, and I address the audience not as a mother, but as a director of the European Training Foundation, that is a European Union agency working in the agenda of skills, uh, employment, education in countries outside the Union, in enlargement countries, for instance, that, of course, from this perspective, are very important for us. And uh, when we looked at our data, there is the same paradox, I believe, we also have seen inside the union, but now I'm talking about our partner countries. So we have, we have had for a long time, we've known these aging populations, and then we look at our education and training systems, and they still focus on the young populations. Mm. Of course, no one is suggesting they should not, but we have known this for a long time, and now we would know, need systemic approach to the lifelong learning. And I like your comment that it's not an organizational issue, it's a systemic issue. So my question to you is that, will you send a message from the businesses for this systemic needs, and are you sort of up for it? Because otherwise, it's obligations to have a day or year will not really be a systemic change. That requires quite a lot more. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. I think we need another awakening to top this up. I've been working with the aging population for like seven years now, organizing techie tea parties and trying to figure out how we can help you know, stay at home longer and da da da. I think the, the industry and the, the world hasn't really sized the potential of, of that. And I think a lot of companies are not yet embracing the fact that we you know, getting older and going to need to top up our human workforce with digital to actually be able to take care of all of us when we get older. I do see some signals. Uh, you can start seeing banks speaking about, you know, new product for people to, you know, get some money out of their house so they can have a nice life when they're there or things like that. But I think our societal reaction to aging is completely, you know, is lagging so massively, and I can only hope we will have an awakening. I can tell you, for working with Japan and, and some of the uh, some of our projects there, that you know there is a crisis. There they have no choice, and they they have some challenge on continuity of of services. Uh, to the citizen, um, and they have no choice but addressing it. And I hope we will do it faster. We need to think about uh, the equivalent of ChatGPT for the old generation, for the awakening of the older generation pro challenge we have. Yeah. Um, to answer your question about whether we would send a message, uh, yes, for, for sure. And I, I think we're, we're, we're trying to do so already. The, the, the business community is, is, um, is, is very clear that we can't just recruit people straight out of school anymore, that we need to make sure that the, uh, the full working population remains skilled, upskilled, reskilled throughout the career. Um, and in terms of vocational education and training, that means um, a, a shift perhaps in the balance between initial vocational education and training and continuous vocational training, um, which has happened gradually, but I think needs to accelerate further, and, and as Chambers of Commerce, we have a role to play in that, but it's certainly a message that we would fully support and, uh, and, and embrace and contribute to. Let's, speak, uh, let's take a few questions from Slida. Uh, Leticia, let me ask you first, uh, how do we make sure that in the upskilling and reskilling policies, we also take gender equality and non-gendered skills into account? 
Yeah, so th those, what's coming in front of us needs very diverse team, yeah? Uh, gender equality is one topic, but it needs to be also, uh, you know, much further diversity than just gender. Yeah, I mean, you know, racial and, and all type of equality uh, you, 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 you want to think of. Um, and the reason for that is if we don't have equality in the minds that are creating the AI, we're going to... Um, basically not realize we are making biased decision and and we're going to automate some of those in systems that can have a much bigger impact than a human that has potential bias so it, it is a critical topic to 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 look for a diverse team it's it's a it's a challenge as a woman in in tech i you know uh, we trying to, uh, you know, be role model, be out there, and, and actually kind of uh, make sure that we are facilitating, uh, you know, more diversity into, into some of those teams. Uh, but we need much more. And I think it needs to, 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 to start as well with the education system. Mm -hmm. I think when we are young, so I'm French, yeah, I guess you would have heard that, but in France, you know, we kind of tell you, you, you're scientific or you're lit, you know, you, yeah. you're left brain or you're right brain. And from the beginning of school, from your age of 15, you have to choose what you major on. And you lose a lot of the things that um, may be important. And I think, you know, that that division at school level needs to be much softer because we've seen that before. The best advice you were giving is you need to be a bit good at math, but be good at the soft things too. And that we have it in our educational system in many, many countries in the EU. Uh, so, so I think we need to blend more rather than... Uh, yeah. And then, you know, maybe that would help actually women uh, be more interested into, in, into, those, uh, into those kind of uh, degrees and, and, and job. Um, so I think education has a big role to, to play uh, and society and cultural uh, alignment too. Ben, I've got a question to you uh, to follow up on education from Slido. We've got a question. Uh, what are the main conclusions of Euro Chambers 2022 survey on the twin transition? Which skills should be taught at school? Which afterwards? Which skills should be rather taught at school and which afterwards? When it speaks, when we to follow up on the importance of education, mm -hmm. as Leticia was saying. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the the survey on the green and the digital transition um, demonstrated that. Um, businesses are quite concerned that they don't have the um, access to, to people ready for the implications of energy efficiency, renewables, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Um, I can't precisely say which should be taught in school and which should be taught later, but clearly there needs to be um, a better focus in both the initial training on that education. they receive and the continuous training that they receive on those aspects, but it's quite basic in a small company. Um, the, the, the companies themselves need to be trained about the, the, the potential new IT technologies that they have to um, adopt, the digital transformation, the implications of the, the green deal and the green transition on their company, um, the, the, the skills assessment requirements. So it's, it's a huge uptake for, for a small business. Um, and, and we look at it from the perspective of the small business owner managers um, rather than the skills, uh, rather than the schools, I guess. So, so that's the important aspect for us. And uh, as I said, many of those skills that they currently believe are the soft skills, the transversal skills mm. that will help with the adoption of, of digital technologies and, and um, the requirements of the sustainability transition. Uh, and I've got another question to you. And I'm so, so, sorry, whoever sent it, I'm going to uh, just try to ask it because I can't, I can't find it now to quote it exactly word by word. But what one piece of it, that's the question to both of you, what one piece of advice would you give to an MBA student who specializes in data analytics and AI? This question was coming from Slido and 
that's to both of you who wants to go first. Yeah, so collaborate with uh, the companies mm. uh, as early as you can and, you know, obviously work on your soft skill as well. So uh, how do you manage people? How do you communicate? How do you create trust with your teams? How do you, you know, all of, the, all of those other things beyond the te technicalities of, of knowing data science data and all of that kind of things? I think anybody who's studied that has got so many potential options. It's hard to give them one piece of advice, but it, because it's applicable to, to many different different contexts. So I guess it might be slightly banal, but just go for whatever field you, you, you want to be involved in, because data is going to be crucial to pretty much every job that's out there in the future. And one more question from the audience, if we've got uh, questions here, could you raise, could we, could we get a bit of more light, please, because I can't see well in the room. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have more questions in the audience to wrap up this, this session? Could you raise your hand if we do? Uh, we've got a question here, please. Can we have the microphone in the middle? Yeah, it's coming. It's coming, just a second. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Teodora Tanasova. I'm the managing director of XAR Training, is a vocational training center in Cyprus. And it is more of a thought than a question. Since uh, we said so many uh, important things, I was wondering whether um, the, the problem that uh, we, we are all entitled, each company of training, like 200k for three years. Most of the employers, I have spoken to them, like of smaller companies, they had no idea about it. And afterwards, the employees, like all employees, very few of them, they know that they are vocational training centers, that are creating courses, and that they're entitled to do these mm. courses with, eight, with only 20%. So I'm thinking that there is a general connected problem that could be solved if um, vocational training centers at first were collaborating, uh, and then uh, for education system, if like at each level were collaboration. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It, is a, it is a bit of a comment, but we can get some comments on your comment here on stage, Ben. Well, I, th I think collaboration and joined up thinking between stakeholders is, 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 is critical. Um, the, the needs of the business community need to be understood by um, education institutions. The challenges, the uh, constraints of the education institutions need to be understood by the, the employers. They need to work together and that's I think where these centers of vocational excellence can, can, can really, really help. Um, another interesting aspect that came out of the uh, European Parliament of Enterprises a couple of days ago, um, and you may remember this, was that many of the entrepreneurs in the room felt that there is not enough funding for vocational education and training. And um, the reaction of many of us in Brussels is there's lots of funding, but it's clearly not reaching the, the people who necessarily need it. So there's um, room for improvement there in the way that the funding is, is dispersed and absorbed. And of course, we can all work on that together. Um, but I don't believe that there's not enough funding. It's just we, we've got to make sure it reaches the end goal, the end target um, as efficiently as possible. And that can help to address some of these issues. Letitia, some final thoughts uh, on the importance of vocational training. And we're going to wrap the. Yeah, continuous learning is the way forward uh, for all of us in any capacity. That being, you know, something that we explore on our day-to-day -day life or that we volunteer and take in, in, our, in our jobs. I think as uh, it was said in the, in the keynote, you know, the, the people that are embracing uh, the learning will be much better off than the one that are not. And I think it's a it's collective duty if you want to succeed, I suppose, in that, in that new era of the fourth industrial revolution. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Leticia Caridou, Managing Director in Accenture, leading uh, data AI businesses in Europe and the conversa conversational AI domain globally, excuse me, and Ben Botta, CEO of Euro Chambers. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot as well to Andrea Nalis, Chair of Executive Board of Federal Employment Agency, who was here a little bit earlier. Thank you. All right, we're going to continue. Thanks a lot to the speakers. And the next session is coming right now. Don't go far. And we're going to be focusing on digitalization and the future of work. Now, first of all, let me tell you how how the session will go on. We're going to have a few parts. We're going to have the keynote speech. Then we're going to, that's going to be followed by a discussion with another keynote speaker. And I'm going to keep this intrigue a little bit for you. And then there will be the Q&A possibility. Again, we're going to speak to the room here. Those of you who are with us in Brussels at the ACT and those of you online, please keep those questions coming. Just please make sure that this time when you're going to be sending the questions, we're going to be, you're going to be sending them depending on this session. So please choose the correct name of the session. And this is digital digitalization and the future of work. Now, I'm going to introduce the first keynote speaker. We are going to be joined now by Professor Stuart Russell, who is connecting live from Berkeley in California. Uh, he is about to connect now. Good afternoon and good morning to you. Can you hear me well? Uh, yes, I can hear you fine. Good morning, everybody. Sorry Excellent. Again. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Professor Stuart Russell, Professor of Computer Science at the University of California, Berkeley, and the author of Human Compatible. He's one of the world's most respected experts on artificial intelligence. He has given interviews in which he assesses the current state of AI, its perceived threat to our lives and the power of algorithms on social media and beyond. He also founded and leads the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence at Berkeley and is also a co-author with Peter Noving of the authoritative textbook in the field of AI, artificial intelligence, a modern approach. Now, Professor Stuart Russell, please, the floor is yours and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we can move to the first slide. Um, just want to get everybody on the same page. Waiting for the slide to move. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, so artificial intelligence is uh, the study of making machines intelligent. And um, what that has meant for most of the history of the field is machines uh, whose actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. So this is a uh, a very standard idea, not just in AI, but in control theory, in economics, in operations research, that we create machinery that optimizes for objectives that we plug in uh, to the system. Uh, and examples of that include AlphaGo, uh, which plays Go at a superhuman level, where we give the objective of winning the game and it learns how to do it. Uh, and your navigation system on your smartphone where you just give the destination and the system finds the shortest route to that destination. So this is a pretty straightforward idea. But the important point for this presentation is what is the end goal? So the end goal is to extend and generalize and empower these systems to the point where they can do anything that human beings can do. Uh, and we've called this general purpose AI, some people call it AGI. Um, and by definition, uh, that's going to have a huge impact because if you have systems that can do anything that humans can do, then they can deliver the kind of civilization that we aspire to, uh, where everyone uh, faces um, no physical uh, deprivation or, or social deprivation. Um, and uh, if we think about the implications of that for our economy um, next, then um, we could, at a minimum, replicate uh, the standard of living that we currently achieve in 
uh, the advanced economies uh, for everyone on Earth, and that would be about a tenfold increase in the GDP of the world. Uh, if you turn that, uh, as economists like to do, into a net present value, the sort of cash equivalent of that income stream, it would be $13.5 quadrillion. Uh, so that acts as a huge magnet in the future, which is pulling us forward uh, almost unstoppably uh, towards uh, a world with general purpose intelligence. Uh, obviously, we could do things besides just replicating our existing civilization. There are things we could do to enormously improve healthcare and education. Uh, we're already seeing science advancing much faster as a result of AI. Um, and one can only dream that perhaps our political uh, activities could be significantly improved. Next. So the obvious question under that situation is going to be, what will human beings do? So here's a quotation. If every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, if in like manner the shuttle would weave and the plectrum touch the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants. Uh, and so Aristotle here in 350 BC was predicting technological unemployment uh, as a consequence of artificial intelligence. Um, if we, if we think forward, so next slide, please. What is the logical conclusion? Sorry, go back. Mm -hmm. What is the logical conclusion uh, of that chain of thought? Uh, it is that as AI systems start to take over every aspect of managing our civilization, we humans lose the incentive to learn uh, all of the skills that we currently learn uh, to understand how our civilization works, uh, to manage it, and so on. So we break a chain of passing on our civilization to the next generation that has been mostly unbroken uh, for millions of years, actually stretching back to pre-human ancestors uh, who passed on technology to their descendants. Um, and so in WALL-E, we see the uh, logical conclusion that human beings become enfeebled um, and they essentially become completely dependent on machines to manage their civilization. Uh, and this is a theme that we see um, also in E.M. Forster's very famous short story, The Machine Stops. Next slide. So one proposal that we see quite a lot uh, is that we will retrain humans um, to be data scientists, for example. Next slide. And so the, the vision is that uh, instead of all the current uh, occupations that people have, um, the, a, a significant proportion of the population would be engaged in data science. Uh, next. But this is completely um, unreasonable uh, because the world will never need more than a few million data scientists because uh, almost by definition, uh, data scientists are dealing with very large quantities of data, uh, and so we don't need very many of them. Um, next. We also see a lot of wishful thinking, which I'm uh, showing here in pink through the, the rose-tinted spectacles. Uh, AI will empower humans, not replace them. AI will automate tasks, not jobs. AI will take care of the tedious task, leaving you more time for the interesting parts. Uh, and here's an economist speaking, any advance that increases labor productivity also tends to raise the demand for labor and thus employment and wages. So this is an interesting economic view, and it's actually often expressed as a mathematical theorem. But imagine that the particular technology we generate, uh, you might call it uh, your better twin, uh, creates uh, a machine that can do everything that you can do. Um, and uh, will take your job uh, or any of the new jobs that economists talk about being created uh, and do it for nothing. So it's not hard to see that in that situation, uh, there would be a lot of employment. It just wouldn't be employment of human beings. It would be employment of our twins who are willing to work for nothing. And so the theorem simply doesn't really work. Uh, if you're interested in uh, ensuring that human beings are employed. Next slide. 
So to understand the impacts of technology, I, I found it helpful to use this example, where on the x-axis, uh, we are describing the progress of technology here described as the width of a paintbrush uh, for painting houses. And so we start with very, very small paintbrushes, uh, which makes painting houses very, very expensive. And on the y-axis, the number of house painters who are in work. And when house painting is very, very expensive, very few house painters are employed because it's too expensive for everybody. But then as technology improves and how... Uh, and paintbrushes become a practical size, so now 10 centimeter width is a normal size paintbrush. Uh, suddenly, it becomes very affordable to have your house painted, and lots of people get their houses painted, and the number of house painters goes up. And then, at some point, uh, when we get um, roll paint rollers and spray guns, uh, it becomes possible to paint houses relatively cheaply, but people don't want to paint their houses every week. Uh, they're still painting the house every 20 or 25 years. And so demand saturates. And then as the technology improves further, so that you have entire teams of house painting robots, um, it becomes uh, very cheap to paint houses, but we still don't paint our houses every week. And the number of humans employed in house painting uh, drops down towards zero. And so this inverted U curve, we actually see in practice in many, many industries, we, we saw this in agriculture, uh, in car manufacturing, in steel making, uh, and it's for the same simple reason that demand at some point will saturate uh, and then automation has the effect of reducing employment. So what's confusing here is that the effect of automation can either increase employment or decrease employment, but it depends on where you are along this curve of satisfying demand. Next slide. So what that means is that uh, we can't look at a technology and determine is this technology per se complementing or substituting, where uh, an economist uh, uses the word complementing, not to mean that it complements human skills, but simply that it increases employment and substituting means that it decreases employment. And so my argument is that complementing and substituting the effect on employment are not a property of the technology. They're also a property of the demand response to the output of that technology. Uh, so if people live in big houses, uh, then paint rollers are complementing because we still haven't satisfied all the demand for house painting. Uh, but if people live in small houses, then paint rollers are more than enough to paint houses efficiently, uh, and then they would have the effect of reducing employment. Next. So what this suggests in terms of, uh, sorry, go back, please. What this suggests in terms of choosing how we decide to apply artificial intelligence, uh, it means we should look at needs that are not currently met by humans because they're too expensive for human beings to do. And so a simple example of that uh, would be tutoring of children. We know that tutoring of children is very, very effective compared compared to classroom teaching, uh, but it's far too expensive for the vast majority of the human race. And in fact, we could never do it in practice for all children. Um, but if we could use artific artificial intelligence, we could meet that need uh, using AI tutors. Next. So here's the conundrum that we face. Um, everyone thinks, wouldn't it be terrible if automation replaced all the jobs? But if you look at it from another way, if you were thinking about writing science fiction uh, 10,000 years ago and you predicted that in future uh, people would go into these buildings with no windows and they would do the same thing 10,000 times a day and they would do that every day until they died, um, your publisher would say, I'm sorry, this book is so ridiculous, we're not going to publish it, that could never possibly happen. Um, but that's actually what did happen. We have been using most people as robots uh, for the last 10,000 years. And this is coming to an end because now we can use real robots. Um, and so uh, we face this problem that uh, routine physical labor uh, in the advanced economies is already uh, largely replaced. And you, 
it's very difficult to make a subsistence living uh, with uh, physical labor. And this will also uh, start to be the case with routine mental labor. And we're already seeing, for example, that freelance copywriting wages are dropping dramatically uh, because of the introduction of large language models. So the question is, what else are human beings going to do next? Um, and this was a question raised by Keynes in a famous paper in 1930 on the economic problems for our grandchildren. Uh, and he suggests that our problem is actually the problem that's been in waiting for our whole existence, um, waiting for science to release us from economic cares, from the need to stay alive. Um, and then the problem is, how do we live wisely and agreeably and well? Uh, and Wall-E, that uh, image that I showed you from the film, uh, is precisely not living wisely and agreeably and well. So if you think about what's left after physical and mental labor are uh, eliminated, I think you have to look at interpersonal roles where we as humans have a comparative advantage because we know what it's like to be a human being. We have direct experience uh, of the, the various kinds of emotional uh, and physical impacts that life has on people. Uh, and machines, on the other hand, cannot have that direct subjective experience. So interpersonal roles at the moment, um, there's, a, there's a wide range of them. They range from so fairly high status jobs like psychiatrist, uh, and executive coach, um, down to very low status jobs like childcare, elder care, um, which are not very well paid, even though we consider them to be extremely important. Uh, so for these roles to have high value, like the psychiatrist, they have to be based on knowledge. They have to be effective. Uh, and this is where we have fallen down. Uh, we have not invested in the human sciences to make those roles effective. Um, and so this has to be, it seems to me, the direction for uh, policy, both in the sciences, uh, to develop that new foundation for how uh, how to interact with each other in a, in a way that's, uh, that has a strong positive effect. Um, and then also in the education system uh, and the professions uh, to, uh, to enable people to function in these roles successfully. So in some sense, I'm agreeing with the previous speaker that the soft skills are actually going to be important, although it may not be, we, we may not have reached that conclusion by the same route. Um, so in summary, AI has enormous potential, uh, and that potential is creating unstoppable momentum. Um, but uh, it inevitably raises this question of how human beings will, uh, will exist. Uh, what is the nature of coexistence between humanity uh, and machines that are capable of doing everything that human beings can do? I think there is a way forward, um, but wishful thinking, uh, particularly commercially motivated wishful thinking, uh, is not a substitute for changing our policies uh, so that we are ready when this transition really begins to accelerate. And I think it's starting to happen. There's still considerable work uh, on the technical side of AI to be done. Um, but I think many people are seeing this unfolding over the next one or two decades. Uh, and as we know, it takes many decades to really shift our, uh, our science base and our education system. So with that, I think uh, I will say thank you very much and um, look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Stuart Russell, Professor of Computer Science at the University of California, Berkeley, and the author of Human Compatible. Now, uh, Professor Stuart will stay with us online, and he will also take a few questions here, either here in the audience or from Slido. So uh, please get ready with those questions. And for the second part of this session, I am very happy and honored to invite here on stage to join me, Elena Rivo, Regional Minister for Employment and Equality of the Government of Galicia in Spain. Please.
First of all, thank you so much for being here with us today. Good afternoon. Thank you so much thank you for the invitation. Um, Ms. River, let's start with how is technology reshaping society in your constituency? What changes do you observe in your country, in your region? Digitalization is transforming all, us, all aspects of our society and at the Junta de Galicia we are focused on designing policies in all areas, no? in, with digital training, as all the speakers said before, we are training citizens for, in digital uh, skills related to all aspects of life and at all ages. New, profi new professional profiles, because uh, companies are demanding uh, professional profiles adapting to the new digital area. And with elderly people, as the Professor Russell uh, said before, we are investing on new technologies to maintain and improve the quality of life of older people. In environment, we use new digital uh, tools to improve urban and rural planning and to manage our natural cultural resources more sustainability. We are committed to a balance between growth and sustainability. And in the social uh, field, we train specialists and take advantage uh, of the opportunities offered by the new technologies in social, legal and humanistic fields to develop inclusive and responsible digital uh, solutions. Uh, is it more effective that policymakers attempt to steer technological development and implementation away from potential harm or if they put effort in empowering citizens and workers, for example, fostering their skills or giving them the means to react so that they are less exposed to abuses by technology? I think both the strategies must go hand in hand. We must create, as uh, the other speaker said before, a legal framework that prevents harm that may arise uh, with the use of new technologies, no? uh, focused on data, uh, privacy and cyber security. And uh, we must provide uh, uh, our workers with the necessary training so that they can face the, the new challenge no? of the labor market. And at the Junta de Galicia, we are uh, working on programs in at the training on reskilling of workers, no? uh, that they can be better prepared to the, the, lobs, the jobs of the future. And um, we um, have to be able to take advantage of the new uh, opportunities that this, this new area offers us. Uh, or everyone uh, has uh, um, talked about uh, um, the danger no, of the, the AI, but I think it's a new opportunity that uh, um, uh, the, 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 um, I think we must show the, uh, the technology um, as a ally. No? Mm -hmm. And at the Junta de Galicia, we develop a digital tool based on artificial intelligence to mass supply and demand. And I will, uh, we call EMI, Intelligent Employment in Spanish, the acronym. And I, I would like to insert a video to show you how this uh, tool works. Please. Let's, let's ask for the video, please. Marina trained in renewable energies, driven by her commitment to the environment, turning to the Galician Autonomous Government's training and job placement services for advice and guidance on labor market insertion. Buenos días. Hola, buenos días. Tenía una cita para orientación laboral. First phase to define the competence profile based on ESCO, the European classification of skills, competences and occupations. Second phase, training and occupational recommendations based on the applicant's profile, mathematical analyses and in accordance with the real situation of the labour market. Third phase, collection of labour market data based on these recommendations. Fourth phase, identification of training specialities that favor labor market integration. EMI, Emprego Inteligente, es la nueva herramienta del Servicio Público de Empleo de Galicia, que utiliza inteligencia artificial para proporcionar una orientación de alta calidad para las personas que buscan empleo, baseada en el perfilado competencial con fin último de fomentar la inserción laboral. 
Este proyecto es un referente inspirado en las indicaciones de la Unión Europea y está a servir de ejemplo para otras administraciones. The Galician Autonomous Government is working to synchronize supply and demand in real time and to guarantee the creation of quality employment. And uh, as the speakers uh, said before, we, we don't eliminate the humans. Uh, it's a tool, a, a, an important tool, but uh, supervised and controlled uh, mm -hmm. with our employees of our uh, employment offices. Right. Uh, Minister, what is the most suitable level of governance to address the issues you heard during the day and from Professor Ross as well? I think there are uh, transversal problems that require involvement of the public and the and both public and, and private sector with ed educational authorities to make, like they said before, lifelong, uh, lifelong learning a reality with labor authorities to understand that training uh, employ for employment as a qualification focus on the job and professional reskilling and uh, to develop tools, tools at the national level that facilitate this lifelong uh, training, such as micro-credential. I think it's a, 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 a tool that we must uh, improve uh, to uh, manage this reskilling uh, for the new uh, um, area, no? with the new technologies. Uh, with public and social service institutions to develop uh, policies without forgetting that the employment has an important social dimension to make the principle of no one left behind a reality. And with the private sector to detect possible uh, capacity gaps, no? um, I think. And uh, what, what do you see as the main challenges of enforcement in your country? And would you have any uh, best practices to share? I think uh, uh, Galicia, like other regions of Europe, is facing a demographic crisis. We have to face the challenge of training, retaining, attracting talent, because our working age population uh, is uh, decreasing. We have to face a uh, demographic transition, uh, which joins the green and the digital transition. For this, I I congratulate with this new platform for the Commission uh, to, uh, cap, uh, to attract talent to, uh, to Europe. And uh, we, we, um, I think we, we must uh, anticipate the, the needs of the market, the demands of the companies, and to know the skills of the population. For this, this tool that uh, we have uh, show, and um, we, uh, we have great uh, map of uh, skills of our uh, population, and to try to connect, um, to focus our uh, training mm. uh, politics for reskilling our uh, employers, and um, and we have uh, work with uh, clusters and businesses uh, to know uh, which skills specifically they need, and to focus our training, our political. Uh, training programs uh, to reskilling our population. Mm. Uh, we're gonna let's take a few questions. Thank you so much. Uh, and we, we do have more questions coming to you and Professor Russell, who is still online. Let's let's just please hear from him to make sure that both speakers are with us. Uh, Professor yep. Russell, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Fantastic. So you are here with us. Uh, both speakers are here. So let's. Uh, Let's go with the questions. Please ask your questions as well from the from the audience. I see the hand there. Okay, let's let's start here. Can we get a question uh, in the middle of the room, please? Here, if we can have the microphone, and then I'm going to bring the slider questions. Oh, oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. My question is for Professor Russell Stewart, please, and. Uh, Professor Stewart, um, you asked the question, what would we left for, for humans to do? And the question for me, more practically, is what will workers in a specific workplace, whether it's a factory, a normal company, will do when they are exposed to working along with AI systems? So the question here is, what can they do in order to spot possible risks in order to know that they are really working with not only one AI system, but all often they work with a multiplicity 
or converge, convergence of AR systems, and what can they do to not only spot risks, but also prevent possible AI-related incidents? Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Um, so that's a very interesting question. And so I, I assume by risk, you mean sort of, for example, in a, in a factory, they might be physical risks from, uh, from robotic systems that are not well designed. Um, and this has been an ongoing process. So we've had robots in factories for many decades. Um, and for example, in car manufacturing, uh, they've now replaced, in some cases, 90% of the workforce uh, with robots. So the, the risk to the worker is simply that there isn't work anymore. Um, but for systems that can operate successfully um, in, as it were, direct contact with human beings. So the typical uh, robot in a car factory is, is physically separated from humans because it's, um, it, it's unable to, uh, to see. Uh, so often, for example, the welding robots don't have a camera to actually see what they're doing, so they could weld a person just as much as a car. Uh, and so they're typically separated by barriers and so on. So when robots are interacting directly with human beings, they have to be much more sophisticated. Um, and as you're probably aware, uh, we haven't been able to really succeed with, uh, with robots that drive cars on ordinary streets. That's still very much in the experimental phase. Um, and so I, I think regulation will or should uh, ensure that before robots are uh, are working directly in, in potential contact uh, with human beings, um, that they're thoroughly tested and that standards are implemented to ensure that those systems are safe. And all the robotics engineers that I know uh, take extreme care um, over this issue and are developing ways of programming robots that, so that they are guaranteed to be safe. But it's, it's a very, very difficult thing uh, to actually uh, ensure uh, that under no circumstances could the robot uh, harm a human being physically. Uh, and I think we're still short of being able to do that. We have techniques that work very well in practice, um, but that's different from having a guarantee. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. River, I want to ask you a question coming from Slido. Just a second. Uh, if technology keeps changing with speed, in the light of work-life balance, how can we ensure the right digital skills and education is well acquired? Oof. <laughs> and um, uh, perhaps we, we we need this this um, this AI um, tools to know. Uh, what uh, what people uh, needs for reskilling, no? And um, I'm uh, agree with other speakers that uh, perhaps there are no uh, we destroy uh, works but no jobs. Mm. We destroy uh, employment, and we think there will be um, different jobs, no? And young people now uh, after pandemic uh, time uh, prefer more. Um, um, free time for um, enjoy life. So I I I, I think that um, uh, jobs are changing and the work is changing and uh, with new technologies we must face these changes. I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah 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 of course. Thank you thank you. Um, please raise your hands here in the room. I'm going to try to to combine the questions from the room and the questions coming on Slido. We do have one more question please here in the middle uh, of the room. Yes, so thank you very Hi. much Klaus Heger here from the European Confederation of Independent Trading. It's a question to Mr. Uh, Professor of Russells. We we many years ago we had meetings from our teachers and um, they were always saying we're a bit worried because we don't want to become puppets of some kind of economic system. And what we heard today is the impression, I have the impression, is that everything is about the needs of the economy, or the need of, of the new technologies, the need of the artificial intelligence and 
Professor Rossi was referring to it, what do we actually, how do we make sure that we remain humans, that we keep our culture, we keep our civilization, and which are the values we can, we can transmit without really becoming just, as I said, puppets of the needs of the economy of the new age? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Rosa, can you... Could you pick here? Could you hear me? Yes, yes. Excellent, yeah, please. Um, yeah, so I think this is a really important question. And um, it is true. I mean, we, we could try, as for example, the um, actors and screenwriters in the United States have done, we could try to reserve occupations for humans. Um, and so they went on strike, and one of their demands was that AI systems could not uh, replace them as, as screen actors or, or as writers uh, for films and television. Um, but I think in the long run, that's, that's not going to work because it's just a, a fact about how economic competition works, that if you can produce the same product for half the price because you're using AI, uh, then you will outcompete uh, companies that are still using humans to do that. Um, and you can sort of try to hold back the tide um, by putting these sort of reservations around certain occupations. But I think in the long run, that's not the right direction. Um, instead, I think we've got to, well, in addition to the directions I suggested in my talk, that, that the more interpersonal roles uh, would be areas where humans uh, will be working in the future. Um, I think you also have to have a cultural movement. Um, if you think about the incentive for education, for example, why, uh, why do people spend 15 or 20 years um, being educated? Uh, a lot of that incentive, not all of it, but a lot of it is for economic reasons, that um, their parents know that if their children are not well educated, they won't be able to get good jobs uh, and they will, they will live in poverty. And um, what happens when that incentive goes away? Where we could, as is shown in Wall E, all have very comfortable lives, uh, even if we're not educated. Um, and that's sort of the future of, of being like cattle, uh, or puppets, as you put it, uh, which is, to me, extremely undesirable. So we need an alternative kind of incentive for becoming educated, for acquiring skills, for having agency. Um, and one incentive system is cultural, about how we view each other and how we perceive ourselves. And if our culture emphasizes being well-educated and having skills as part of being uh, a real human being, someone who is worthy of respect and has status, then that can have a strong incentive effect. Um, but this is sort of beyond my pay grade. I'm an AI researcher. I'm, I'm not a cultural theorist. But, uh, but I really think we need um, a culture shift to put far more emphasis on the, the knowledge, the skills, the capabilities, uh, the, just the ability to live a rich and interesting life as, as an essential characteristic of what it means uh, to be a human, so that um, we gradually replace the economic incentive for uh, acquiring an education with this cultural one. So, so thank um, you so much. Yeah, please. Same. And um, I'm a professor at the university before international government, and um, I think we must change the, the education because uh, now in the business we don't use a fax, so we use uh, mails and you, we use uh, other apps. So I, I, I think we have changed. When we we're, were children, we need books um, to look for uh, now. When you uh, want to, to look for a dictionary, you look at the Google or uh, other apps. So I think in, the, in this way, and I think we have always the resistance to the change, you know? And uh, we, um, we must um, use um, tools to, um, 
to help the, to surprise our students and to show that uh, uh, new technologies no, and uh, AI uh, is a, a tool. And uh, I think uh, we, make, we have to make an effort and in the school as the university to change our uh, way of um, educate. And, and, and while we're here with you, I've got another question for you on Slido. On some of the real examples of upskilling, what results have you seen so far using AI system for the population? If you could share some of the, some of the examples. Of reskilling? Yes. AI system for population, upskilling using AI, yeah. Um, now at, um, um, at your, our region, uh, we have a lot of um, changes and we need to reskilling people from the naval sector, from the, from the uh, industrial sector and from um, well, That's one of the spheres. A lot of uh, activities through the digitalization mm -hmm. sector because we need uh, a lot of profiles with these skills in digital areas. It's the most uh, demand. Mm. Uh, there is another question. Can I start with you? And then I'm going to uh, ask the same for Professor Rosa. Since AIs are programmed by rules, rules are set by humans. How will they not be created to be harmful to humans? We are getting back to this, how to make sure that the harm is minimized and how to harness rather the benefit. Uh, um, the others, uh, last week I, I was in a conference and um, they say that uh, uh, there is an influence, influencer, uh, an artificial influencer, no? So, um, to, um, I, I think it uh, could be helpful no? to know the difference between fake news and influencer fake. And, uh, but uh, the, um, in the media, in the marketing sector, they, they, they are using AI uh, to, uh, to change their way of work. But um, like the other speakers said, I think w uh, what's... Um, the AI uh, can change is the creative, no reply. The creative, the emotional things, I think. But um, I think legal framework, or perhaps uh, like when internet started, everything was uh, afraid, scary about internet. Now uh, internet is in our life. And I think it will be the same with um, these uh, algorithms. Um, Professor Rosa, did you hear the question? I'm trying to... Yes, yes. Could you please comment on that one as well to pick it up? Yeah, so um, it's true that AI systems were programmed using rules in the 1980s. Um, that's, that's no longer true. Um, the humans are not writing the rules. In fact, the humans are not programming the AI system at all. Uh, the AI systems are created by a process of learning. Uh, and in the case of uh, systems like ChatGPT, the large language models, as we call them, um, they are trained uh, simply to imitate humans, to imitate human language behavior. And, um, and then the second part of the question is, uh, how do we make sure they don't harm human beings? And this, this is the area that I've been working on for the last 10 years or so. Um, and the way that harm occurs unless, of course, you could do it deliberately, as, as we might do with autonomous weapons, but let's put that aside. The way that harm occurs is that we are um, setting objectives for AI systems that are not actually um, aligned with our real interests. So to give you an example, the social media recommender systems, so the, those are the algorithms that decide what billions of people read and watch every day. Um, those algorithms are designed to optimize an objective, which might be the number of clicks uh, that they can get from the user or the amount of time that the user is spending on the screen with their particular platform. And uh, in order to do that, in order to optimize those objectives, the algorithms have learned to manipulate human beings, actually to change us so that uh, we become more predictable from their point of view. Um, and anecdotally, at least, 
uh, the way they've changed us uh, is to make us more extreme versions of ourselves uh, so that we are more predictable. Uh, and that cr has created a lot of polarization uh, and has been a really destructive force in society. Uh, another example would be bias. So how does bias come in to machine learning algorithms? It's not that there's a lot of white male programmers who want the AI system to favor white males. I think that's a myth. Um, but what is happening is that uh, the white male programmers think that the right way to program an AI system is to, is to get the machine learning system to, to match the training data as well as possible. Um, and this is, you know, this is a technique that goes back literally hundreds of years in statistics is, is to minimize the predictive error of the system on the training data. And the problem with that is if your training data is reflecting a society that is already filled with bias, then by reflecting the training data as well as possible, your machine learning system ends up replicating that bias. And this is a problem that we should have seen, but we didn't, partly because of those white male programmers who are mostly oblivious to these kinds of issues. Um, so I'm obviously, you know, uh, caricaturing, uh, but I think there is an element of this happening. Uh, so the answer is actually build AI systems uh, that know that they don't know what the true objective is, that there is a future that uh, human beings want to bring about, uh, but the AI system should know that it doesn't fully understand what that future is. And this, this creates AI systems that are actually um, much more deferential to human beings, that behave more cautiously, that ask permission, uh, that allow themselves to be switched off and so on. So this is a, a direction that my research is taking. Uh, thank you. Mr. Reva, question for you here on Slido. How can the public sector speed up the process of reskilling? And is there a difference that you would see when it comes to the pace and the speed of it with private sector and public sector? So how can we... Sorry? Uh, how can the public sector speed up the process of reskilling? Oh, mm, with... Um, uh, we, we, we we talk with the, the private sector, with the businesses, and asking the, the needs, no? the, the skills they need to uh, employ people. Hmm? Right, and, and, and that would work with the public sector? We, uh, uh, yes, we, we ask from the public sector to the private sector, right. and uh, we try to, uh, to see the needs to reskilling, and um, sometimes we have our young a big company close and we try to uh, a lot of um, unemployment uh, increase uh, we try to reskilling these people to entering another uh, companies no uh, usually uh, now we have a lot of needs in the building sector and in the uh, technology sector so we try to reskilling yeah. and to focus our training public uh, training uh, in these lines so we, for designing our public uh, lines of uh, reskilling, we ask first to the mm -hmm. private sector. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, Professor, the final question to you, one of the most popular ones on Slido, on the AI or your robot twin, obviously, on the example that you mentioned there during your keynote, isn't there an underestimation regarding how fast this will come about and the cost of it? So it's everybody, everybody got into the idea of imagining your twin, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, that's a thought experiment sim simply to, uh, to get people to understand that this, the, the sort of soothing voice of the economist who's saying, well, you know, there's always be new jobs, right? Well, there won't always be new jobs um, because the AI system will already be able to do the new jobs as well as the old ones. Um, so how quickly we've been we've been both overestimating and underestimating. So you can go back to 2014. So nearly 10 years ago, people were saying that the self-driving car will be you know for sale next year, um, and uh, you know all of taxi drivers and truck drivers will be out of work 
uh, by the end of the decade. Um, so that hasn't happened yet because the problem turns out to be much more difficult than we expected. It turns out that in fact humans are incredibly good at driving uh, and to, uh, to replicate or exceed uh, human skill levels is very, very difficult uh, technologically. Um, but the impact has been in fact that uh, truck companies are having a very hard time finding drivers because young people uh, understood that truck driving careers would no longer exist. And so they didn't go into truck driving training programs and they didn't want to take jobs as truck drivers because they didn't see a future in it. Uh, so oddly, you know, we now have a shortage of truck drivers uh, rather than trucks being driven by AI systems. But what tends to happen is that uh, things, to quote uh, Ernest Hemingway, things happen gradually and then suddenly. Um, so if you look at um, freelance uh, writing jobs, so there are websites where uh, freelance writers can go and find work from people who need things to be written. Um, and within two months of the release of ChatGPT, um, income on those websites dropped by 10%. So check, check. that's an incredibly fast impact. Um, and uh, we, we may see similar kinds of impact. I think another area that's under, under threat right now is uh, warehouse operations. For example, Amazon runs warehouses and I think they employ approximately a million people uh, in those warehouses. And basically the work is divided into two parts. There are human beings whose job it is to pick the right object from a storage unit and put it onto the conveyor belt or send it off to be, uh, to be put in a box and sent off. Um, and then there are robots who go fetch the storage units that have the object and bring it to the human because the robot is not able to pick the right object out of the storage unit from the shelf. Um, but now Amazon is introducing robots that can do exactly that. Um, and so because we were using the humans in a very robotic role uh, and the robot skills hadn't quite caught up, huh. um, we, were, we, were, we hired a million humans to do that. But now uh, the robot skills are catching up and those million human jobs are under significant threat. Uh, and that could happen in the space of a year, you know, that, that we might see not just an Amazon, but many other logistical companies, we might see millions of jobs disappear very quickly. Thanks so much, Professor. Thank you. And we're going to have one little... Co are we going to... Yes, we are getting one final... Sorry, I know there are more and I still have more in Slido, but we've got to wrap it up. But we do have one more... If we can have the microphone here in the first row, please. Anybody has the mic? We don't have the mic. So thank you very much. I, I would like to come back to this issue what will humans do when AI takes over? Well, the positive vision would, that be, would be that of Keynes saying, well, we have a lot of time to, be, uh, to take care of ourselves and to uh, have cultural activities. But that was some time ago. Now, is it another alternative? And that would be pushing humans into the virtual reality, the metaverse reality. <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, that humans finally more and more live in the virtual reality. Uh, and this would be, I think, less interesting than uh, the option uh, Keynes uh, gave us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I will uh, keep this comment and this thought here, and that's how we're going to wrap it up, because I am running out of time, and we've got to be very strict on this. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for all the questions and the questions on Slido and Riva. Thank you so much. Professor Rosa, thank you very much for this session. Things happen gradually, and then suddenly we are nearing the end of the first day of our forum. And we've kept something very exciting until the end, which is a TED Talk by Tim O'Reilly, who is joining us remotely from the United States. Mr. O'Reilly is a world-renowned thought leader on cutting-edge technology, and he's the author of WTF Economy, 
what's the future and why it's up to us. Let's see if Mr. O'Reilly is already on the screen. He is. Mr. O'Reilly, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Where in the U.S. are you about? I am currently in Los Angeles. What's the California. time? Uh, it's uh, about 8.28 in the morning. That's all right. So the cue for you to start is an enormous Brussels applause we're sending to you over the internet. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, I am doing this uh, without controlling my own slides. So I'm going to have to say next slide each time. So next slide. So uh, there's a famous painting by Delacroix of the biblical story of Jacob wrestling with an angel. He can't win, but he comes away stronger from the fight. And today, in facing the challenge of AI, we are wrestling with an angel. Or is it a devil? Uh, the UK a uh, AI Safety Summit seems to think it's both. Uh, artificial intelligence has begun and promises to further transform nearly every aspect of our economy and society, bringing with it huge opportunities, but also risks that could threaten global stability and undermine our values. Next slide. Uh, President Biden's uh, executive order Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, 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 makes the same uh, point. Responsible AI use has the potential to help sur solve urgent challenges while making our world more prosperous, productive, innovative, and secure. At the same time, irresponsible use could exacerbate social harms such as fraud, discrimination, bias, and disinformation, displace and disempower workers, stifle competition, and pose risks to national security. Uh, I'm going to explore this question of the promise and the peril. Uh, but I want to start with just an actual illustration of an interaction uh, uh, with an AI. N uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is only a small selection. So that image that I showed you was actually created by Dolly uh, 3 uh, following instructions uh, from GPT-4. Uh, I was using ChatGPT, which uh, in in the, the the pro version now actually is able to call another AI, the the one that creates images, and it generates much more interesting prompts and gives you a much richer interface. So you can see on the right uh, there is uh, a, a a bit of my conversation. Uh, I asked it to create a, a rendition of. Uh, of a battle between an angel and a devil in the style of Delacroix's Jacob wrestling with the angel. Chat GPT uh, first says, to comply with the policy regarding the creation of images in the style of artists whose latest work was created after 1912, I will create an image that evokes a similar feel without directly copying his style. So you see, first of all, there is an intervention uh, that by the developers of Chat GPT to try to protect against a particular uh, kind of behavior. Now, it's very easy to get around, in this case, by telling the truth. Uh, I responded, Delacroix's painting uh, was uh, was uh, created in 1850, so it's not protected by copyright. Can you generate a version of that painting that shows the angel wrestling with the devil? And it replies, I appreciate the clarification. With that in mind, let me create a new image that depicts an angel wrestling with the devil, inspired by the expressive and dramatic qualities of Delacroix's 1850 painting. So it generates that, that image that you see uh, on, on the left. Uh, next slide. So there's several things that I want to highlight. First of all, I'm no artist, and I can now generate a remarkable image with only a few instructions to an AI, really a conversation. This is a huge increase in human productivity. And as you've been hearing through this conference, this will affect all knowledge professions. But there's a really interesting thing. I know Stuart uh, uh, Russell just said, uh, you know, you have to put away the blandishments of, of, of economists who always say there will be new jobs. But I think there's a lesson that he did not talk about, which is the real economic lesson is that when things become cheaper and easier to produce, People create and consume more of them. And the choice that we make, the angel versus the devil, is whether artists will be augmented by AI or replaced by it. And I, I think we're still early in this revolution, so AI's power is, is understandably scary, and our response to it is deeply divided. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
This was also true uh, in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, William Blake, uh, the famous British poet, referred to the dark satanic mills. Uh, and, and it was quite true that they were horrible. The buildings of England and the lungs of its people were blackened with coal smoke. Children slaved in the mills. Workers were crowded into slums. Disease was rampant. Meanwhile, the wealthy mill owners and merchants prospered. And this is a pretty dark picture. But at the same time, the Industrial Revolution did bring enormous benefits. Uh, Brad DeLong's wonderful book, Slouching Towards Utopia, describes how in the late stages of the Industrial Revolution, all of a sudden, uh, GDP went vertical, relatively speaking. Uh, and so the thing that was interesting was uh, this, this concept that economists talk about, uh, which was originally described by, by Malthus, which is that as you get more productivity, uh, you also get increased population. And so in this chart, you see the increase in population uh, from 8,000 BC to the present. And then you also see the, uh, the average real income, which is the blue line. And you can see it actually goes down slightly from the beginning of the agricultural revolution because we get more population uh, and, uh, and uh, it eats up all the benefits of, of, of productivity. This was called Malthus's trap. Uh, uh, so as a result of this, as Brad talks about in his book, if you were to go to the Middle Ages, next slide, uh, and you, you look at this picture, an illustration from the Queen Mary Psalter in uh, 1310, and you see peasants who are harvesting grain by hand with sickles. And you then, next slide, you look at a uh, Egyptian mural from the 18th dynasty, uh, about uh, uh, 1500 BC. Uh, so 3,000 years earlier, people were doing it pretty much the same way. And next slide. And that really started to change in the 1800s when suddenly machines, originally horse-drawn, then powered by steam, uh, started to change things. And all of a sudden, food, clothing uh, became much more abundant. And uh, there's a really interesting point, though. Next slide. The Industrial Revolution did create jobs, but it didn't create them by some kind of a magic. It created them because... Once things become cheap, human imagination finds new ways to use them, right? So when we think about AI, we have to think not about what it's going to uh, do away with, but what it's going to create. And I don't think we know that yet. So when they first started doing uh, machine-powered spinning and made cloth cheap, they had no idea that fashion would one day be something that everyone, not just the rich, would enjoy. And so there was this revolution in textiles where all of a sudden people went from having one or perhaps two outfits to having dozens. We had fashion, we had retail that became uh, trade increased. So all of these things, there's a wonderful book by um, Stephen Johnson called Wonderland that talks about this. Uh, by the way, that illustration there, uh, going for the transition from homespun to richer clothes, was created by ChatGPT. But we also experienced this same thing in our own uh, lives during the computer revolution. You know, mainframes used to be giant machines. Uh, they sat in a, a refrigerated room. Uh, I think Thomas Watson once said, uh, the, the founder of IBM once said that uh, there would be a need for only a few of these machines. Uh, with the personal computer, we saw there was millions. <clears throat> and by the time we got to the smartphone, there were billions. And we're doing all kinds of things with these phones that we never imagined in the days of the early mainframes, which simply replaced existing processes. Even the personal computer largely replaced existing processes. So this is a, 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 a next slide. Uh, this is an idea that uh, Clayton Christensen, the, uh, uh, the business professor, uh, once called the law of conservation of attractive profits. 
He said, when attractive profits disappear at one stage in the value chain because a product becomes modular and commoditized, the opportunity to earn attractive profits with proprietary products will usually emerge at an adjacent stage. Now, I saw this back in my own career. Uh, I was talking about open source software and the internet, and how this was changing the fundamental nature of the computer industry away from proprietary software. And it was when I started to predict that the the rise of today's giant uh, big data companies you know where i said look uh the control over hardware was once uh, ibm's lock on the industry microsoft uh broke that when the the computer hardware became a, a commodity uh all of a sudden software became very valuable now software is becoming a commodity something else is going to be valuable and we got today's internet and so this is Next slide, the nature of the angel we're wrestling with, which is how to use the new technology to make existing products and services cheap and abundant while creating new sources of value that were previously unimaginable. And it's really important to understand, this is a piece of economic history that you need to take into account, that when we first started thinking about economics, the early classical economists really thought the only source of value was agriculture. Everything else was moving it around. And then, well, actually, you know, manufacturing turns out to be pretty valuable too. Uh, but trade, that's just moving it around. And then trade becomes valuable. And we're up to the present. You know, Adam Smith thought that uh, uh, entertainment was, uh, you know, complete waste. And so all of a sudden, now we have this huge entertainment economy. And of course, we're, that is also under threat with AI, as we will we'll see. But this is evolution in what we consider valuable and what humans trade. Jobs are not just about trading the commodities of the past. They are creating the valuables of the future. And you see this today in the entertainment economy online, where there are internet influencers who make enormous money in a market that everybody thought, oh, this has destroyed the value of copyright. No, it didn't. It, it created a new business model. So what's the devil we're wrestling with? And I, this is the thing that I think is the most important. New jobs are created, but they aren't necessarily good jobs. During the Industrial Revolution, reformers like Robert Owen struggled against the tide. He, he was a young entrepreneur. He took over the new Lanark Mills in Scotland, and he he went, oh, my God, you're, you're employing children in the, in, in, in the mill? Uh, let me set up a school. All my workers are sick. Let me get them doctors. Uh, and, uh, oh, my God, you're keeping them in, in servitude by selling them uh, goods at high prices in the company store. And so he became an activist. And, uh, it, but it took more than 50 years to end child labor in England. And it persists around the world today. So the risk is how we use these technologies. You know, and it, it's true that, yes, you can, uh, you know, what Stuart said in, in his talk earlier, or his comments earlier, that uh, if you don't adopt the new technology, somebody else will, and therefore the market is going to drive us to the lowest costs. But there are limits that we place on these, uh, uh, this race to the bottom in costs. You know, we did make a decision that we would improve working conditions, that we would share uh, the proceeds of productivity more widely. And that change is a long, hard struggle. Uh, so uh, let's see, I, I think you're already on my next slide. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Luddites. You know, we, 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 this is something we, we, a term we use. Uh, this was a, a revolution, uh, an attempted revolution in uh, in uh, guerrilla warfare, where they were destroying machine looms in uh, the early uh, eight, 1800s. And they were really not anti-technology, but they were fighting the way the technology was being deployed to benefit only the owners. So labor organizing did not exist. They fought to gain awareness, to buy time. There's a wonderful new book by uh, technology writer Brian Merchant, uh, Blood in the Machine, about uh, uh, rethinking the Luddites and how that applies to today's technology. It's just out. He wrote a column in the uh, um, 
Los Angeles Times about uh, the the uh, uh, the writer's strike for, for film, and it was the first workplace battle between humans and AI. But if, when you think about what was at stake, it was about how AI would be deployed, not whether it would be deployed. It wasn't a protectionist idea that we say, oh, we do not want to use AI in our job. It was, we want the writers to receive the benefit of this productivity boost. You know, so effectively, the, the studios wanted to say, wow, you've written a script, now I'm gonna train you know, uh, uh, an AI on, on your script and uh, I'll write new ones without you. Uh, or, and then we'll just hire you for a little bit to, to clean it up. And the writers were like, no, no, our deal is we get to use it when we feel like it helps us and it makes us more productive. And so you can use it to make workers more productive or you can use it to simply uh, drive down your costs. And why has this happened? That is the devil we're working with. And I think for that, let's go back in the next slide to the, um, uh, uh, the AI Safety Summit. They talked about two particular categories of risk. And the first one are misuse risks, you know, bad actors. And the, the second are loss of control risks. And I actually think these two things are closer together than we think. This idea of loss of control risk is something that in AI circles is called the alignment problem. Next slide. And that's described, uh, you, and you may have heard about this in the, in the conference already today. Uh, how do we align you, AI with human values? You know, and the most extreme fear is you've seen in science fiction, the Terminator or HAL in 2001. Uh, the machine gets a mind of its own, decides to exterminate humans, uh, no longer obeys them. We should be mindful of this possibility, but it's, it's what they, you might call a tail risk. In fact, many observers see this as misdirection by the big tech companies, urging government to focus on the extreme risks instead of regulating current harms. The alignment problem we're sure to face is one of unintended consequences in which we give the machine an objective whose outcomes we don't want and don't understand in advance. Uh, Stuart again referred to that, but the examples he gave, I don't think really get to the heart of it. Next slide. Because what they really come to is whose human values are we trying to align with? Are we trying to align with the values of those who embraced Robert Owen's call to end child labor and improve the lot of workers in the dark satanic mills, or the values of those who resisted that effort in, in, a, uh, in order to increase their profits, the values of those who are desperate to respond to the climate crisis today, or those who still deny and re resist the necessary action, the values of those who seek prosperity for everyone, or the values of those who seek enormous wealth and power for the few. That is the central risk is how widely AI is disseminated and who controls it. And so, you know, how are we to manage the risks? The Bletchley Declaration, which came out of the AI Safety Summit, promised that the signatories would work together on shared safety standards in a process officials likened to the COP Summit on the climate crisis. Next slide. How's that going? Next slide. The alignment problem is not new. Corporate governance is a great test case for AI governance. Corporations and financial markets are nominally under human control, but they're resistant to that control in pursuit of their ill-considered master objective. Attempts at governance, such as ESG, have largely failed because they're just kind of added on. They're not central to the narrative. So humans come to serve the machine and their masters. So what is that ill-considered objective that we have already given to the machines we have built and the economy we have built? Uh, uh, Milton Friedman in 1970 wrote the standard the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And we ended up, particularly in the US, but really everywhere because the, the US is so influential, with a model of business which looks to maximize profits and thinks that that is virtuous and that somehow it will trickle down to everyone else. But we actually know from experience, and I think Europe is a great counterexample where 
actually taxing those profits and distributing them more widely is a very powerful tool for building a better society. And we have an opportunity once again to say, what are we going to do with this new power? Are we just going to let a few run away with it and get enormously wealthy? Or are we going to make sure that everyone gets a cut at it? And there's two ways to do that. And one is to make sure that the, the technology itself is widely distributed. And the other is to make sure that uh, so that the, the people can be creative with it and can invent the future for themselves. And the other, of course, is to the extent that the market gets out of whack, to correct it rather than accept these uh, imbalances. Next slide. I think it's really important to understand and when you hear uh, the idealism of the early pioneers of AI that this goes wrong. You know, uh, Sam Altman, uh, the uh, CEO of, of OpenAI, says our mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. But hey, back in uh, 2004, uh, uh, Larry Page and, and, and Sergey Brin at uh, Google said, adopted the motto, don't be evil. Uh, they, were, they still are an idealistic company. Uh, Jeff Bezos in 1998 said our goal is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. But again, once again, next slide, how's that going? 2019, Google removes don't be evil from its corporate messaging. Uh, 2020, 2023, Department of Justice sues Google for anti-competitive behavior. Uh, uh, 2019, European Union initiates an antitrust investigation of Amazon. Uh, 2023, the Federal Trade Commission, the U.S. sues Amazon for anti-competitive behavior. All of a sudden, this idealism becomes replaced by the need to increase profits because the market as a whole demands that companies continue to increase our profits. So we really have to rethink our entire market system, I think, in the face of this challenge because we have already built a system which has this wrong objective, and we don't want it to propagate to our AI systems. So I, I've been writing a lot about that. Ne next slide. Yeah, here, we, we've got it. Um, I wrote a, a paper recently with uh, Mariana Mazzucato and Elon Strauss uh, about the way that um, the big tech platforms of today uh, operate machines that allocate human attention, shape our knowledge and beliefs, and they start by serving us, but once they become dominant, we can see the evidence that they increasingly serve themselves. And this problem will become even more extreme in the age of AI. Next slide. So uh, here I want to uh, bring up one of the things that Mariana, uh, who's an uh, Italian economist working in London, uh, uh, says. And this is to talk about what do we mean by a free market? So tech boosters like the venture capitalist Mark Andreessen says that government must keep its hands off to ensure a free market. But to the classical economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, the free market was not one that was free of government intervention, but this one that was free of rents. This is one of Mariana's key points. To an economist, economic rents are profits above a normal rate achievable in a competitive market, which are gained because of asymmetries in power and ownership. So we have to think deeply about who owns AI and who controls it. And I think our regulation should be designed to make sure that no one company dominates, not even just a few big companies dominate this market. So uh, next slide. You know, so I, I worry that the current approaches to AI regulation are a kind of regulatory capture leading to toothless promises uh, that will ensure monopoly power, shaped by a few large companies focused on imagined future risks uh, with voluntary commitments and vague assurances of risk management with few details, much like we've seen in the social media era, and extremely limited disclosures. And I think, so governments need to take a stronger hand, not just regulating AI, but using it and shaping its future, having national AI programs where we're building, because that, there's, there's a lot more to think about here, but how do we actually make sure that there are models that are trained on cultures and we don't have this as an additional force for the homogenization of, of human culture? Next slide. Uh, we need to increase transparency. Uh, one of the things that I found in my research on the big tech platforms of today, how much we wish we knew 
that's coming out now because of whistleblower lawsuits, because of government lawsuits, that should have just been part of the regular reporting by these companies so that we could have seen what they were up to as we went along. So we need to increase transparency now. And there's a thing called the Stanford Mo Foundation Model Transparency Index, their key findings, uh, the very top model, which is an open source model called LAMA2, scores only 54 out of 100 points. But they note that there's a, across the realm of models, about 83 of the, or 82 of their 100 indicators are, 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 are dis disclosed by at least one model developer. And so I've been pushing for this notion that we need to actually take all these indicators, this data that uh, companies use to manage and train their models and make it public in the same way that we make company financials public. We need to actually require far more disclosure of these companies. They're gonna push back and say, this is proprietary, it's secret. I think it's a big uh, uh, reason why we should be asking for it precisely because it is the key to their market power and we don't want as much market power. So the other thing we need to do is to regulate at the speed of technology. Next slide. Uh, not at the speed of current government action. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, you got it. Okay. Um, and, and there's a company called Giscard as an example. I, I think I, I chose this one because actually the, the EU has invested in this uh, French company, which is building automated AI test suites to evaluate other AIs. And that's a great example of uh, government trying to build more capability to decrease the market power and to increase the transparency of this market. I also think there's an idea for, uh, uh, next slide, what I would call decentralized AI. And there's a, a young uh, developer I know who, who wrote a, a uh, manifesto, which he called Humaic Intelligence. And he said, uh, we, to solve the alignment problem, we need a new paradigm for building AI. We need to start from the bottom up rather than from the top down. We need AI that is built by the global community, not by a single company that is truly open only in name. To do this, we'll need a regulatory framework that ensures that AI is fully open source uh, rather than one that protects the incumbent players. We need to rethink the purpose of AI so that it's human-centric. We need AI that's not safe just in the narrow technical sense, but ultimately beneficial, not just for companies that control and monetize it. Uh, next slide. And I also want to quote from uh, Stuart Russell's uh, book, Human Compatible, where he was talking about uh, beneficial AI and his research on that. And I think there's a really crucial idea in that book, which is that we want these machines to be deferential to us, to humans. And if we want them to be deferential to humans, it comes back to that question I asked earlier, which humans? And that says to me that if we want to have machines that are trying to understand our values, they will have to cascade. It can't be one big central set of AI where the values are set and controlled by a few large companies. The values are going to be set by groups, by nations, by cultures, by individuals. And we'll need a cascade where we have AIs that are trained on just us, AIs that are trained on the groups that we belong to at various levels, and AIs that are trained on the, the knowledge of all humanity. And these things, we have to be thinking about how we're going to be building an ecosystem of AI, not just a single monolithic AI. So that goes back to my original illustration of ChatGPT talking to Dali. That's the small beginning of uh, AIs that are able to converse with each other. They're, they're representing uh, their owners. And in order for that to happen, we need a distributed ownership. So next slide. In order to achieve this future, we need strong markets, lots of innovation, but we also do need strong government. So, but there's another final piece that I wanna talk about to bring this back to this idea of jobs. And that's next slide. There are a lot of problems still to be solved. You know, uh, our, I like to say, we will not run out of work till we run out of problems. Just look around the state of our infrastructure, the challenges of climate change, the fact that there's wars feeding the world. 
ending disease, resettling refugees and integrating them into society, routing out bias, caring for each other, educating the next generation, and enjoying the fruits of shared prosperity by entertaining and caring for each other. These will never go away. And if they go away, it's only because we are building the dark satanic mills rather than building the prosperous society that we can build. Uh, uh, Nick Hanauer, who's a venture capitalist, he was an early investor in Amazon, uh, 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 writes, prosperity in human societies is best understood as the accumulation of solutions to human problems. We won't run out of work till we run out of problems. So. When you think about this future, think about how we move this enormous power to focus on solving the problems that we really have, rather than the problem that the market currently sets to itself, which is, as Brad DeLong says in his book, Slouching Towards Utopia, uh, finding new uh, ways uh, to, to, to make products for people who already have uh, resources. We need to actually make this AI be much more focused on lifting up the entire world. Next slide. We've done this before. You think about the Great Depression uh, and how fast certain things happen. Uh, for example, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation moved from 10% of homes having electricity uh, it, uh, in 1930 to more than 60% uh, only 10 years later. We can move quickly on enormous problems like climate change. We can, as we free up this enormous power of AI, we can apply it to new problems. You think about, you know, again, obviously we, we fought an enormous war and then we had to rebuild after that war. And But the choices we made, the choices we made about how we would deploy our industrial might are the same kinds of choices we face today, how we deploy. This is why when I say WTF, what's the future? It's up to us. What choices are we going to make? And that's why, next slide, I love this picture of Jacob wrestling with the angel, in particular, Rilke's poem about it called The Man Watching, because he says, this is the original painting, by the way, uh, what we fight with is so small. And when we win, it makes us small, right? We need to fight with great things. We need to fight with the challenges of our day. And we have just been given a superpower with which we can do that. So next slide. These are not small things. Let's use the new capabilities that AI will bring us to make a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tim O'Reilly, founder, CEO, and chairman of O'Reilly Media. Thank you once again. And now I would like to invite on stage Dragos Pislaru, member of the European Parliament and chair of the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs, for closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be here with you, dear Commissioner Nicola Schmidt, uh, dear colleagues uh, in the European Commission. Um, what a simple task to speak after <laughs> Tim O'Reilly. Yeah. Uh, but, but I would just, you know, like to have your attention. I know that we are towards the closing. I would try to, you know, more or less try to put some things and wrap up a little bit. A wonderful day with so many amazing speakers and contributions. In this edition of the European Employment and Social Rights Forum 2023 could not have been timed better. It is in the middle of the European Year of Skills that we need to celebrate and continue to celebrate until May next year. And as mentioned already here, it's in the middle of the negotiations of the AI Act and the Platform Work Directive. So it's very timely and indeed it is a talk about the future and about regulation and about the role that governments and businesses and, and partners are playing on that. And it has, this has an implication not only for Europe, which proudly say is leading the process, but also for the entire world. And good timing indeed, as if any one of us would actually look at this week's news, we see what? We see the Beatles now and then soundtrack that was released on the 2nd of November, 
that is topping the charts in UK, Germany, and Austria. And this is something that, you know, it really, uh, it's just the 35 time that the band is in top 10 and first released after 1996. And it's real, it's happening these days. And this is machine learning, this is AI. Um, or yesterday, the prestigious scientific magazine Nature has an amazing article about the chat GPT entering into classrooms and how education is transformed by this use of large language models, LLMs. So, and, and the whole debate there is that we've started to talk in the education sector about fears of AI and the fact that we are right now afraid that students will not do their essays anymore and how do we test and grade them accordingly. But nowadays what is happening is it should really transformation the education process by using AI to instill better learning processes and be sure that we have the right skills that are going through. And, and indeed, I mean, if we look at another news of this particular week of yesterday, uh, we have the discussion about Microsoft introducing AI backgrounds into the metaverse and, you know, using that as part of the deployment of technology metaverse and not only of that. What is that? I mean, I can say simply one word, progress. That's what we are talking right now about. And the question of today and the question of this debate is how do we ensure that this progress driven by AI is enhancing innovation and competitive power? And that in a way that is future-proof while protecting fundamental human rights and brings forward societal benefits and social progress. How do we find this, dear Nicholas, dear Commissioner, you said finding the right balance? And that's the quick question. And we have earlier Tim O'Reilly talking about angel fighting a demon. And this is nothing good or bad about AI. AI is just a tool, it's technology. If it's anything good or bad, it's about people and our choices. Let's not move the choices about good and bad towards the technology. Let's reflect on our own behavior. And it is our own behavior at societal level, be that at users or corporates or governments, uh, to decide where we want to go forward with that. And today's session provided numerous very, very fertile answers, very fertile ground to answer these, these questions. AI has indeed the potential to improve, to scale business performance, job creation, labor market access, workforce upskilling, and reduce physical hazards. At the same time, it may and will lead to offshoring, to job shifts, to losses, cybersecurity issues, uh, platformization of work, uh, potential abusive or discriminatory practices in the labor market, 24-7 working, uh, on-call working time. And all of these are part of the creative disruption. That is not new. We see Schumpeter talking about that. Uh, we had the, uh, the distinguished uh, Sir Christophe Prisaridis talking about that. And I remember in Brussels, when I, when I came here as a member of the European Parliament, in the Brussels Economic Forum, 19, 2019, uh, Sir Christopher Pisaridis had the eighth annual Tommaso Pado Ascopa lecture on the future of work, and he was talking about technology and disruptive potential of technology influencing the future of work. And here he was today, after just what, four years, talking about an unpre unprecedented shift that AI is bringing here. And AI, it's, it is about skills, and I would like to come back to the European Year of Skills and one of the key themes that I think that we need to, to, to take into account. And the skills in the age of AI have to be aligned, that indeed that's the word alignment, aligned to a change of paradigm. And it is a big shift. It's a shift from machines assisting humans to humans assisting machines. And indeed, as comfortable or not comfortable we are, we need to reflect on that. Because generative AI disrupts traditional roles, professional will lean on AI-powered peer-to-peer channels to learn, upskill, and navigate new career paths. And besides digital and technological skills needed for our workers, we need this constant update of knowledge of computer science, statistics, and programming languages to manage algorithms combined with the essential trainings in ethics and equity. And indeed, it's really amazing that after a generation of trying to push STEM teaching and learning in our education, right now, all of a sudden, 
people are starting to take philosophy classes and degrees. Because that's where we talk about human values, human ethics, the choice is between right and wrong, good or bad, and fighting our own demons. And indeed, skills are right now the new currency of the future of work. And it is clear, and I think that this was the outcome of the, today's discussion, that artificial intelligence is and has the potential to be a net job creator in the coming five years. And it all depends on the choices we are taking. And we need for that, and that's a very important segment that was discussed today by young entrepreneurs, we need for that the young generation to be part of. Right now, we are assisting at a very important fight that was highlighted today about making AI socially desirable, about being sure that we are not going to leave it without demystifying you know, the, the really fake news or the, the, the bad things that are talked about it. And one important ally for that is indeed the young generation, the young entrepreneurs, and incentivizing the young, providing mentorship and creative safety nets is very important for them to be able to shape a society that they will be by far better prepared to do than the older generations. This is about not saying for the young people that the future is yours, but that the present is yours. The young generations are digitally native. If they are to deal with this technology and be sure that they will help us, you know, bring up the good part of it. Last but not least, while reflecting on EU policy and regulation on AI, because this is a topical issue today, we have first to be proud that EU and Europe is leading the way. And this gives us the responsibility to consider equal access, equity and inclusive growth, social responsibility and gender balance, safety and security as basis for ethical AI and future of world of work. An overarching ethical framework that further builds social progress and well-being. And with proper debate and action on how to distribute productivity gains properly, this is one of the topical issues for tomorrow, and we are indeed leading. And I cannot end before saying that we had an amazing legislator, an amazing legislator in the European Union. Together, the European Parliament, the Council, the Commission, we worked as Team Europe. We passed through and navigated in times of crisis. And the solution that we picked together was solidarity and pursuing you know, the objectives of the European Pillar of Social Rights. Minimum wage, pay transparency, asbestos, RRF, sure, and many other pieces of legislation were crucial in order to be sure that in Europe and with extensions abroad, we are actually having a better, better world. So we should be proud about the way in which Europe is debating things. But we should not be lenient and allowing a change of paradigm. And today is as much about celebrating what we have achieved in the last years, but also leaving a legacy for a right debate that would actually shape a better future. Indeed, this legislator that I was just said that it was good, it was also the first time after many years where the question if the generations that are coming will be living better than us was put again. And this is crucial. We need to keep on and fight for a better world. AI, it is clearly a force multiplier for human intelligence and productivity. The AI is far reaching across industries, transforming the way organizations make critical decisions. And the use of it is changing the power balance and the traditional labor management relations in workplaces, underlying the need for co-governing AI systems in the spirit of social dialogue. There are so many opportunities there. And indeed, there might be differences across the world in terms of how regulation is perceived. And if we are looking over the Atlantic, the US prefers first to, let, to leave the industry do things and then maybe see if there is anything to regulate or self-regulate. But even the owners and the leading entrepreneurs in the field, including Sam Altman from OpenAI, they would be happy to have some degree of regulation to diminish the negative externalities or effects of AI over population. So we are leading and we are providing a, a good example in the world. 
And all these aspects are of a high priority into our debate as AI will impact our day-to-day -day work gradually at first and then very vast all of a sudden. And sudden enough that our conversation about the future of work will become about the future of our world. So indeed, how do we approach that? How do we find the right balance? How do we fare in between the good and evil, the angel and the demon? I would just say, to sum up, that if we want to tackle AI in the good way, we should be bold, but cautious. We should be daring while being responsible and pragmatic. This is the European way. This is the way. Thank you very much.